Hello, my name is Anna Shaven with LPAC TV. And I'm Leona Fan Chang with the LPAC Basement Research Team. At the end of last week, the Congress appeased the Obama administration yet again, not just with a passage, but an overwhelming passage and support of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012. Now, this is an act that is passed yearly, it's voted on, to maintain the funding for the defense for the next year. What makes this one distinct is that the Obama administration, as verified by Senator Carl Levin in testimony, they insisted that protections guaranteed to the American citizens by the Constitution be removed in order to get them to sign on to it. Mm -hmm. These are protections like due process, right to a fair trial, uh, the right to not be indefinitely detained or incarcerated, uh, you know, of the worst types of stories that we've heard from Guantanamo Bay over the last 10 years. Now, this is very dangerous to American citizens. Obviously, it's very scary. Uh, we are now the targets for the same types of black ops which have really defined the last 10 years uh, since the war on terror. And increasingly over the past months. <laughs> right, with the targeted assassinations. <laughs> now, if people are trying to brush this off, which I really don't think they are, mm -hmm. I think people are taking this pretty, pretty seriously, that would be even more dangerous. But this whole situation gets to a very important problem that we are facing inside the American population globally, but the concentration of it is in the United States. And that is that we are facing fascism. Mm -hmm. And everyone today, uh, in respect to this bill, except for the military leadership, some of the military leadership, is reacting to the, to the act, to the Section 1031 in the Defense Act, from the standpoint of just what's in the act, the immediate threats. Now, what Mr. LaRouche is doing and what we're doing is actually different. And that is that he's making the point that the act is the next step by the Obama administration in a buildup to a thermonuclear world war. And he's warned about this happening uh, between, the, between Christmas and the New Year. And that is how I want to open up today's show. We have two members of the new presidency slate. Diane Sayre, representing Northern New Jersey. Hello. Hello, Diane. And Rachel Brown, representing the 4th District of Massachusetts. Hi. Now, Mr. LaRouche is doing something very specific, which no one else is doing, like I mentioned, and that is he is identifying the threat of this current Defense Authorization Act, this passage, from the standpoint of the future mm -hmm. and not the present. He's addressing it not only from what the document says, but he's also addressing the threat which is not being said, which is not being covered anywhere, which is the real reason that the Obama administration would insist on putting the American citizens in the line of fire like they have. Now, the state of mind that Mr. LaRouche has uh, comes up again as an issue of sense perception versus not sense perception or the brain versus mind, in his latest paper, which is now featured on the website, uh, called The Strategic Situation Now. So what we need people to do is, rather than being surprised or being shocked, rather than impotently trying to protest the Defense Authorization Act, like our Congress is doing, people need to examine their own, their own ways of thinking the, their own fallacies that they're following, and break with them. And break with them as not just a protest against the act, but break with them to actually go after the real threat, which is President Obama. We need to remove him from office. And a good example of the difference between the way that people are reacting now to this act and the way that Mr. LaRouche is thinking about this whole thing is actually his comments from... 2009, because in a sense, you can, in a sense, you could say that Mr. Rouge has predicted something like this, and everything that will come in the line as as long as Obama is there, starting from 2009 when he declared that Obama is in the character, is in the line of Nero the Emperor, and that 
when it comes to desperate situations, when you've driven it to, you've driven the system to an end, to a limit, you have to go for war. And in this kind of time of time, when you go for war, like for example what they're doing with the provocation of Iran, which is inherently a provocation of Russia and China, that war right now on a global scale means thermonuclear war. And this is what they're going for. They're, they, these steps, which are very scary in themselves, are much more scary from this, the, the standpoint of the way that LaRouche is really, with a very scientific imagination, has been able to say, look, the future is, is this. The future is now. You, can, you should be able to see that in your mind's eye and determine, judge events based on, based from, the, from this standpoint. Right. Well, with that, we'd like to open up the show. Diane, do you have anything to say on this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, people who are on the website may see that I posted yesterday on the blogs a short statement called Vaket Auf, or Wake Up. And uh, it is because of this extreme danger and the thing that is really something, if you go out in the street in the United States and organize, the fact that we're on the brink of thermonuclear World War III is not presented in the American news media. So you're talking to people who don't particularly have a sense that this is precisely what will happen, although I would say most people seem to have an intuition. They have a gut sense that something is horribly wrong. And um, what I wrote in there is about people who say to us that the mustache on Obama is over the top. And if they stick around to discuss anything, I uh, ask them, don't they think it would have been better to stop Hitler? Because what they say is, well, where are all the dead people? Who has Obama killed? Where, is the, where are the six million Jews? And you can, I ask, well, do you think Hitler should have been stopped before he killed six million Jews? Wouldn't that have been better? And why was he not stopped? And the reason that Hitler was not stopped was exactly the reason why people today say that the Obama mustache is over the top, because they are not thinking, they're not seeing in what you could call your mind's eye, the directionality, the intent, which has been expressed by Obama even before he came into the office, the very way that they you know bludgeoned the Hillary Clinton delegates out of the convention and you know the entire trajectory has been one of fascism and dictatorship and because the euro system is now disintegrating and these they want to do another bailout they can't figure out how to get the money so the british have no recourse they they have to go to war and that's what's unfolding and if people were able to think straight they would see it so this question of sense perception is exactly the issue that we're facing every day in the organizing. Yes, and he gives a good analogy, I think, which is maybe commonly thought of, but actually gets very deeply to the point. And that's, he gives the analogy of, of footsteps, or footprints. You can see a footprint, or a series of footprints, but you can't see the foot that's generating these footprints. And he says, essentially, these footprints are like what you see with your sense perceptions. You don't actually see with your sense perceptions anything that's going on. You're seeing a shadow of what's causing that action, of what's causing uh, the, the, you know, the result, the end result, which you sense. That tells you nothing about the cause. Um, so this, you can look at... Uh, several different ways. I mean, one in, in the ways that Diane was, was bringing up, just politically, you know, the fact that we have these various events going on around the world, and people want to react to them like they're individual events. You know, they say, well, Ahmadinejad is nuts. You know, can you say this guy is not nuts? Or, you know, can you say that we shouldn't get rid of a dictator? But the issue has, is, has nothing to do with an isolated event, but the intention to create a war which would depopulate the planet. 
and they're you know they're they're looking for the, the British Empire is looking for uh, any different way they can to create that war, but there's a driving intention. The cause of the footprints is is the empire, and what what we what we can do instead, what we have to do is is to awaken in the population that higher sense of creativity, which can look into causes. Um, and that's actually directly what LaRouche and our campaign are, you know, are, are doing. We're playing the role of sort of the, uh, the surprise attack on the Empire, where the fact that we're pointing out, well, this is not a regional conflict, this is an intent to create World War III, that actually opens up uh, you know, for, for others to see the cause of these events, which they otherwise wouldn't be able to to discern, and so we've created through that that uh, that flank, uh, we've created this opposition to the war that you're seeing out of the, the military, and uh, and even the Russian government right now. I think it's significant also to point out that LaRouche has canceled Christmas, and in the really the whole holiday season, and it's not a this is not a a, a cruel act of uh, punishment or something. Of the but Grinch. Right, of the Grinch or something. He's actually said very specifically, he said it again today, that you have a very ominous period right now because Congress has just left. Congress has just left their seats and it seems very calm right now. And we compared it to was the calm before the storm because this is the perfect moment. And he actually also mentioned that the, uh, the Russians have a uh, a New Year's coming up as well. But you have this period, which is a false calm, and it's the perfect time to strike. It's the perfect time for a desperate empire to launch a, a strike. But this is one of those pr examples where there's no, if you were to try to deduce the proof, if somebody asked you to try to, to show me, show me where the war is, by the time you can show them where the war is, we're already in war and dead. Now, that made me think of a point, Diane, that you had brought up earlier in, in discussion, which is we as a society are now facing uh, something which to most people seems impossible. I think most people don't see how they as individuals are connected to a process of impeachment or a process of something which is seemingly so large as removing the American president. Most people think in terms of election cycles. Every four years, you know, or, you know, alternately for the Congress, we go and we, we vote and that's how we uh, that's how we are political and express our desires for the country. It's a funny thing because people can't because people can't think straight. And I was thinking of a conversation that uh, Mr. LaRouche had with the six of us, where he said, "When you're organizing people, what you're trying to do is to you want to hear what they're saying, but not really what they're saying. You want to hear what they're thinking." And, and to give you an example is people say, well, how, how are you going to get them out? And on the surface of that, what it sounds like they want is a mechanistic Newtonian description. We are going to circulate a petition and get 93 million signatures and then congressman so-and-so will introduce articles of impeachment and, and you give them, you know, and if you gave them such a thing, they would say, well, that's ridiculous. That's not going to work because people actually know in their mind that that doesn't work. But our society is all based on sense perception and there's a real culture of mechanistic thinking. And as you were talking, it actually struck me, um, one of our collaborators in New Jersey who passed away some years ago was someone who worked on the space program. And he described his work that you would say by X, such and such a date, we're going to have this capability. By this date, we're going to have this. But there would be gaps in the flow chart because the technology to get 
to the particular point did not exist. So you would have an intent that you were going to create the ability to land on the moon, but you didn't have the steps in between. And I think, you know, Kennedy really was the last president who had a sense of future when he talks about the dams, when he talks about the water projects, uh, the infrastructure and the space program that he had clearly and an imagination. He had an image in his mind of where the nation was going to be, what the population density would be, what energy consumption would be, and he was, and that was in his mind's eye that he was preparing for. And when you think that way, then you have a sense of a dynamic of how things are accomplished, which is not a linear pairwise interaction mechanism. And it definitely is a problem that we are now, I don't know, two generations removed from having ever had a productive economy. It literally does mean that people don't know how to think. Although since the mind is creative, that's the paradoxical thing. Because as I said, if they, they ask you a question, it sounds like they want a mechanistic answer. But if you tell them something mechanistic, they know it doesn't work. So it's, it is quite an interesting challenge um, to actually be able to express to people a truthful concept of principle. But it does resonate when, when you do it. Right, you said that the, the, the better response than, uh, a better response than to go through the steps for them is to say, well, if we don't get them out, we're doomed. Exactly. That's right, you have no choice. And that's why people fight, that's why they do things. I mean, because you know, the failure of doing it is something completely unacceptable. So you say, it doesn't matter. I'm going to figure out this has to be done. And, and that is exactly the point. And when they see that this has to be done, they don't care about every detail because how can you know the details? You know, if you knew before a war was fought what you were going to do to win the war, well, then you wouldn't have to fight the war. So um, absolutely. It's the question of, of necessity and people getting that. Right, yeah, the, the people would not otherwise put their lives on the line. I think this is, this is also the reason that Mr. LaRouche has brought up this question of identity into this discussion right now. You know, uh, a few days ago, LaRouche had made the subject of his discussion that we're in a very precarious situation. You, you may not see uh, the next year, basically. And that's what, that's the type of situation you should expect right now. In the midst of that, he says, that's why your identity, the question of your identity is so important. And there was a couple of aspects that he had brought up. One of them was that your identity reaches beyond your senses. So that was the, what you had brought up, that if you have an identity based on your senses, then really you're in, you're in a sense trapped. Hmm. You're imprisoned in your current body and in now. And then the other aspect, the, so the second step then to identity is a different type of identity, a higher identity, is your relationship to society. Not only in society of now, but the society of all of mankind. So before, of the nation at the least, the world, and then future and past. And then one other, the next step then, would be your identity in relation to the universe. And I think this is, this is probably what you were getting at, but this is, you know, this is what people fight for. People fight for something that's much further beyond what they are, if they can get that sense. And I'd like to hear also what, uh, to what extent we've, you know, we've been successful at getting across that type of sense of identity. 
I find it's definitely resonating. Well, it's definitely resonating with people already. Um, they definitely they might not be aware of that factor in and of themselves. They're not aware of all the cultural influences that are acting on their mind. When people think, "Well, I'm an individual," but they don't actually know. Well, then why do I think the same thing as a whole lot of other people? And there are these, these different influences, long long and short-term cultural influences that shape someone's thinking that they're not really aware of. Um, so, in one sense, uh, a person's reaction, which is their immediate reaction, uh, well, two things. One, it's, sometimes it's just purely sensual or emotional, and then it really has no connection to mind or thought. And unfortunately, right now we have a we have a problem with that because you know people don't have an association consciously with anything bigger than themselves and their immediate existence. So you do get that where you know people respond and they're not really consciously aware of what it is that they're doing. But what we're finding is that if you point out to them, like Diane said, you know something bigger, then they actually identify with that at the same time. They say, "But yes, I you know I am angry about NASA." NASA is what we represent. You know, yes, we did, you know, uh, fight for something in this country. We didn't. We weren't always like this. There is a principle. I'm an American. You know, there's these different things that that they resonate with. Um, uh, if you just if if they see it in someone else. So what we're finding is, as long as we em embody that, that's actually communicating it, even without without explaining it to them what it is that they're responding to. Well, there was a really good example of that this past week, which I was really surprised by, and I guess maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, which was a meeting in northern New Jersey of Democratic Convention want to be delegates, because of course they get elected, and all the delegates are supposed to be for Obama. And I thought, since this is the area of the state where I'm going to be running, that I should go and talk to these delegates about impeaching Obama and why would they want to destroy the Democratic Party and civilization by supporting this guy. So we went to the delegates meeting, I and a couple of the uh, people working with me, and they were giving instructions on how to file and how everyone's going to go to North Carolina and support Obama and they said, are there questions? And I got up and said, well, yes. I'm Diane Sayre, I'm with Lyndon LaRouche, and I'm running for U.S. Congress, and I want to know why the Democratic Party doesn't do to Obama what the Republicans did to Nixon. And then went through, I asked them, has anyone here seen the national uh, statement given by Russian President Medvedev on Russia's response to the fact that we're moving all this you know, military anti-ballistic missile systems right onto the border of Russia. Do you know that their Navy, the Russian Navy, is in the Mediterranean on the coast of Syria? Do you know that our Navy is in the Indian Ocean? We're heading for thermonuclear war. And first of all, I was somewhat amazed that they let me get out an entire briefing uh, without interruption. And then I, I just reiterated, we have to remove Obama. And one woman says, well, she's obviously not supporting Obama. She should leave. And then five people said, no, she should stay. They said, this is America. People have a right to their opinion. And I could hear people around me saying how courageous I was. And I mean, really, a few months ago, I'm sure I would have been escorted or dragged out of the meeting. And instead, you had people there ostensibly planning to campaign as delegates for Obama who were interested in defending my right to be at the meeting and talk to them about impeaching the guy. Yeah, it's... So it definitely... Go ahead. Yeah, just, yeah we're finding that as well um, when we go to events in Boston, labor events, the State House, that, and you now we're saying what we're saying, we've got the mustache on Obama, and we're finding that no one will kick us out anymore either, <laughs> which is interesting because they're, they, they're completely afraid that what that what we say is true, but they know that we have to say it because if we don't, then no one else will. So they really want us to be there saying it. 
And so you just see um, that the situation is wide open for, for leadership. And that this thing that uh, LaRouche introduced recently, Diane wrote a statement on it as well, or cited it in a statement, the idea of a, of a, of a bipartisan, the, no, one, no one trusts any existing institution right now. They're only going to, going to trust you if you say something that, uh, that they know, you know is, is not the, the popular line in any sense. So it's when we go out there and we, and we do tell the truth, um, pretty much anyone is ready to respond to it right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, these type of times where when these, these, these type of times that people all are thinking something, the same thing, or at least similar things, but nobody wants to say it. But it's, these all, it's also these type of times where if nobody says it, then you have... It won't get said. It won't get said. And it really is, it's, it depends on these few people, like yourselves, like what we've been doing on the Rouge Pack TV, to, to play that role, to play that leadership role. That is very clear. Yeah, it's funny. It almost seems like what you guys are describing is there's two parts to people. One is the one they put out for everybody else because those are the culturally accepted, you know, I guess the smallness. But then there's this other side to them which you guys have been relatively successful in kind of tapping into and, you know, and bringing out to the surface. So it's almost like people are, are walking around kind of giving people one face, but, but you know, they've got this other person inside them that just kind of needs to be provoked out. Well, I think actually the, the really big danger in the next two weeks, and Rachel and I and the rest of the slate and all of our offices around the, well, actually across five continents, are totally mobilized, as you said, this period between now and the first week in January when you have the Russian Orthodox or the Orthodox Church Christmas, which is different. Uh, this is a really dangerous period because they're desperate for the war and the Obama's handlers in London are counting on people being in their holiday fantasy time uh, and it is a very dangerous moment where one of the possibilities is some kind of phony staged incident, which could be then blamed on Iran or blamed on Syria. And then in the case, if it's blamed on Iran, Israel takes action and there you've got it, you've got the war. And as far as, as we know, while LaRouche working with a, a faction of the U.S. military who are opposed to this uh, with LaRouche really kicking because I don't think anyone quite gets the timetable the way the way he does. We've jammed things up. We've taken away the surprise factor so the thing did not start in November. But it literally could be the case that you know you wake up and the first strike has been launched. And therefore, what uh, we are doing is a mobilization across five co continents with hundreds of thousands of leaflets, millions of uh, emails on stopping thermonuclear war and removing Obama. And here in New Jersey, we're, we're doing a lot. It's the New York metropolitan area. Of course, Manhattan is completely packed during Christmas. We'll be out at the various church services. We had today a very... Um, effective field deployment in Sheepshead Bay, which people may know is largely Russian, Russian American community and just had a record number of people signing up and contributing. So people are ready to be woken up. We just have to grow really quickly and, and urge everybody who is around us to take action similarly and use the material that's on our website. That's an excellent point. So Thank you for joining us. Make sure that you contribute to our site, contribute to our campaigns, and stay tuned.